Good morning, class. Hi, I'm Keith Moore, and we welcome you to Faith School. Faith School is the place where my spirit is fed, where my faith grows stronger, and where I learn how to be an overcomer. It is good to overcome. Sure beats being overwhelmed and defeated, and that's what 1 John says. This, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Faith and overcoming go together. Doubt and defeat go together. And we are not the defeated ones. We are more than conquerors in Him. Let's pray and release faith for more on that today. Father, all of us agree together as touching this, asking you to show us things we hadn't seen and remind us of things you've already shown us and how to implement them and and put them into practice. And um, any uh, vacant spots that we've got or, or things we've assumed that's not right or we ask that you enlighten us, Lord, enlighten our darkness. And we purpose to walk in the light and be doers of it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We've been looking at Hebrews 3 on our series we're calling Overcoming Unbelief. And let's continue today. He said, Hebrews 3, 7, Today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. The opposite of a hard heart is a tender heart. And the scripture talks about that your conscience can be seared. And it's talking about as a result of this. When you have been instructed and you know the truth, but you won't accept it. And you don't want it to be like that, and you resist it and refuse it and ignore it, that friction uh, causes a, a dullness and a, a, a searing of one's conscience and a hardening of the heart. And you do that enough, and you get very dull. And you, when the worst thing that can, can happen is that your heart was bothering you about something and you ignore it and resist it so much that it doesn't bother you anymore. Well, it's not because it went away or God changed. You just have become very dull. And that means you wouldn't perceive God talking to you about other things either. And we don't want to be like that. That's why he kept, what did he say, well, like three or four times in this passage, don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. Harden not your heart. Everybody said out loud, don't. don't. Harden, your heart. harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. Well, that means you don't have to. That means it's a choice. He goes on to say, I was grieved with that generation, and I said, they do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. Then he says, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now, you, you know, the scripture says that in the last days, there would be people that would depart from the faith. Well, you can't depart from Chicago unless you were in Chicago, right? You can't depart from the faith unless you were in the faith. You can't depart from God unless you were around him. You, you were there. And that's what he's talking about. And we see that with what we've been studying in uh, Exodus and Numbers with God's dealing with his first covenant people that he brought out of Egyptian bondage. They were obstinate. They were what the scripture calls stiff-necked. They just, you couldn't convince them that God could be trusted. <laughs> you, couldn't, you couldn't convince them that God could or would get them into the promised land, take care of them. And at juncture after juncture, they made the choice to doubt him, to question him, to test him, to complain against him, 
to ignore him, to refuse him. Now, I know just hearing it like that, you want to say, what is wrong with these people? Same thing's happening today. Same thing is happening today. Millions are unpersuadable. You just cannot convince them that God is real, that He's right, that His word is true, that His plan is good. They just, they'd rather believe nothing. They'd rather believe false religions. They'd rather just believe in their self and their education or whatever, their technology. They'd, all replacements for God. Now let's go back to what we started studying at yesterday's class, Numbers 16. And we're getting into this 11th event of these episodes where they made the choice to, to be unbelieving. And see what happened. Um, the, in the 14th chapter, it's kind of come to a head. Where the fake, they wouldn't listen, they wouldn't obey, they wouldn't trust. And finally the Lord said, okay, all right. You said you're going to die in the wilderness, that's what's going to happen. So turn and go back into the wilderness. Well, as you might imagine, morale is low. Hmm? Two million people. There's no food out here. There's no water except for the manna, thank God. But you talk about a bleak, barren existence. And see, all of that is typical. It, it's all showing what happens when you disobey God. Same thing is true today. The, the psalmist said that the rebellious live in a dry land. That's literally what happened here, right? And here you see one of the common mistakes of unbelief is not taking responsibility for your own life and your own choices and turning around and blaming others for what you don't have and for what's gone wrong in your life. Whose fault is it that they're not already in the promised land? Hmm? But do you hear them repenting? <laughs> Never. Or, or rarely. Rarely, I should say. Uh, let's read what happens here and see. Korah, verse 1 of chapter 16, son of Izhar, son of Kohath, son of Levi. Notice that because that's going to come up later. He is of the Levites, which are basically the helps ministry. Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, they were sons of Reuben. They took men, and we find out there were 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, and they rose up in an organized, concerted effort to overthrow the current leadership and replace the current leadership. Is this the first time they've done this? It is not. All the way back to when they first came out of Egypt. And they got to the Red Sea. You remember that? And Pharaoh and his army is closing in. And the Red Sea is in front. That's what they said. Let's appoint a captain. We already got a captain. <laughs> what do they say? We, we need to replace current leadership and we need to go back. Why? Because current God-chosen leadership is not going to go back. They're not going to lead you back. They're not going to lead you back into bondage that God delivered you from. Godly leadership only goes one way. <laughs> Hallelujah. Full faith forward. Hallelujah. Grace to grace. Faith to faith. Glory to glory. Hallelujah. Which way are we going? I mean, if it's, if it's God chosen, God appointed, God anointed leadership, it's going to lead you up. It's going to lead you out of bondage and up 
into blessing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And only up. Only. But they don't want that. That's too hard. <laughs> you got. We have to fight. I don't like to fight, they say. I don't want to fight. I just want to go back and eat cucumbers like we used to. So, we got to get rid of this current leadership. Can you see there's a real ugly side to this thing called unbelief? It is not innocent weakness. It is, this is a full-blown rebellion. Not just against Moses and Aaron, against God. And a full effort to replace it. What happened there on the mountain? When Moses was gone for those 40 days, what did they do? They said uh, they, they replaced Moses and got them new gods, gold calves, <laughs> right? And they said, Israel, these are your gods that got you out of Egypt. Say what? Say what? Now, if you were God, <laughs> how long do you think you put up with that stuff? Huh? Is it any wonder? He told Moses, back up. Just, just back up. Get out of the way. I will start over with you. I'll start over. Why? And, and see, he wasn't wrong because they're not going to change. If you'd have given them another thousand opportunities. That's why that generation had to die out before anything else could happen. It was only their kids that would, were willing to actually obey God. By the time they all died out. After that 40 years. And the younger ones had become adults. Then when they went back to the border of Canaan's land. Where they were four decades earlier. When they got back. This time when he said we're going in. They said we're going with you. Is that right? We are not going to do what mom and daddy did. Now it's, it's all right to love your family, but you don't follow them into unbelief. Is that right? You do not follow them into rebellion against God. You don't follow them into disrespect for the Word and the people of God and the things of God. Every one of these things, like, you know, um, Korah's rebellion is something that anybody that reads the Bible becomes familiar with. It's referred to in the New Testament, Korah's Rebellion. Why? This, like what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah, like what happened with Jericho when the walls fell down, these are iconic events that are timeless, that reveal God's character, His will, that reveal... Uh, it, it, has anybody read this chapter about what happened with Korah and his bunch? So we're about to find out in no uncertain terms what God thinks about this and how he sees this. And what we've got to remember is he never changes. Ever. To hear some people talk, you'd think there's an Old Testament God and a New Testament God. <laughs> And the Old Testament God is kind of rough. But the New Testament God, pretty much everything's okay. <laughs> no problem. There's no Old Testament God, New Testament God. No. And God has never changed and He never will. God hasn't changed. Our covenant has changed. Our access to Him has changed. But He hasn't changed. And if we want to learn his ways, they are exactly the same now as they were then, as they were before this, and they will be after this. He is the same. He changes not. So they rose up with 250 princes. They gathered themselves together against Moses, and they said to him, you take too much on you, seeing all the congregation are holy. Every one of them. 
and the Lord's among them. So then why do you lift up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord? When Moses heard it, he fell on his face. We already talked about him being the most humble man there was on the planet. Why did he fall on his face? Because he knows they're in trouble. Hmm? If he hadn't interceded for them, stood in the gap for them already half a dozen times, they wouldn't still be around. And here they're trying to get rid of him. <laughs> Makes no sense. But that's what unbelief and pride and rebellion does to you. It blinds you. It dumbs you. You don't even realize who's on your side. Who's helping you. Makes you try to get rid of the very thing that's been protecting you. And uh, he spoke to Korah and to all his company. While he's on his face there, you got direction too. The Lord tells him what to do. He says, tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who are holy. And he will cause to come near to him even whom he has chosen. He'll cause to come. This, this happens today. This is, this is actually increased in our generation this uh, rebellion and disrespect and disobedience. And the enemy is always trying to move the whole planet towards complete chaos, complete violence. He accomplished it in Noah's time. And it almost got the whole planet wiped out. And the enemy is always trying to do that. And you will see the trend in disrespect. No respect for God. No respect for His people. And if you have respect for God, you will also have respect for those He chooses. And it's not about making a big deal out of flesh. It's about making a big deal out of His choice. Can you see that, class? Yeah, I mean, people are people. They're just like you. They don't know everything. They make mistakes. Leaders, God chosen, God anointed people. They, they're human. They make mistakes. And you can't always respect and appreciate everything that a person in authority says or does. But you must respect the place or the fact that God chose them. Right? Or elsewise, you're disrespecting God himself because he's the one that chose them. Are they disrespecting God here? Oh, big time. They think they got an issue with Moses and Aaron. But God is taking it personally. Keep reading and you'll see. He said, take censors, Korah, and all his company. Put fire in and put incense in, in them before the Lord tomorrow. It'll be that the man whom the Lord does choose, he will be holy. You take too much on you, you sons of Levi. Now see, he, he gives them their phrase back to them. They said, uh, now, now back up in verse uh, 3. Notice their, ac their, their, their accusation, which was not honest. We'll see later. But they gathered themselves together against Moses, verse 3, and against Aaron, both of them. And they said, you take too much on you, seeing all the congregation is holy. The, uh, the Young's literal translation is interesting on this. It said, verse 3, they assembled against Moses and against Aaron, and they said, enough of you. <laughs> uh, the NIV says, you have gone too far. Talking about Moses and Aaron. You have gone too far. The whole community is holy. Every one of them. And the Lord is with them. Why then do you set yourselves above the Lord's assembly? They said, we want a true democracy. <laughs> Where everybody's equal. 
And that's how it is. Nobody's above anybody else. Said who? Based on what? Now, there's another term people have coined for this today, what they were doing. Some people call it speaking truth to power. You ever heard that? <laughs> A.K.A. rebellion. <laughs> Ooh. And except for the mercy of God and being in the age of grace, a lot of people would be in imminent danger. But even though we are in the age of grace, defiance and rebellion still winds up at the same place. Missing the promised land. Missing the blessings and will of God. And in most extreme cases, missing heaven. They said, paraphrase a little bit, Moses and Aaron, you have just got too big for your britches. You think you're all that. And you put yourself over the people. And all the people, so, now see, they're lying. Because they're not after everybody being equal. They're after them being in charge. And that's how all of this socialist, communist, everything else. Oh, we, we just, we're all equal and we're all going to work together. No, you're not. No, you're not. The devil's a liar. I said, he's a liar. What he wants to do is steal, kill, and destroy and a few people take control of everything and have everything and everybody else serve them. It's always how that winds up. And so Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and 250. Now this is, uh, this thing has support, right? These are leaders. These are famous people and people of renown. So when they come out and they said that, Moses just hit his face on the ground. Can you see what he's thinking? Oh God, will we survive this? Survive what? Their rebellion. And he he heard from God, laid on the ground there, and he said, all right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to let God show who he picks. That sounds fair, don't it? We're going to hold an election? No. <laughs> no election. God's going to show. How many understand he had already shown? Is that right? How about getting them out of Egypt? How about at the Red Sea, right? How about manna out of the sky, water out of the rock? I mean, over and over and over again, had they not seen that everything Moses said that God had said was true and it came to pass and it happened just like he said? But what you got to see about this unpersuadableness, it doesn't care about the truth. You, when you want to say, well, Come on now, let's reason and, and, and let's remember. They don't want to hear it. Does not want to hear it. Doesn't care what the truth is. It's unpersuadable. It wants to take over. And part of this, can you see, a lack of trust in God means I can't wait on Moses and Aaron to lead this thing and on this God, we don't know what he's going to do. We got to get control of this thing and we got to take care of ourselves and we already know what to do. Ain't no future out here in the desert. We just got to go back to Egypt and see if they'll take us back. So they want to get rid of Moses and Aaron. <laughs> and uh, so then uh, verse Eight, he said, Moses said to Korah, Here I pray you, you sons of Levi, 
Does it seem a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do service of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation of, to minister to him, them? He's brought you near to him and all your brethren, the sons of Levi. And do you seek the priesthood also? Big characteristic of unbelief. It is disrespectful. It is unthankful. God handpicked Levi and that family and that tribe and let them do all the labor and work of the tabernacle. They have an uh, illustrious position in the nation. And they have all the provisions of the offerings. And no, that's not enough. They want to take over the priesthood. They want to take over Moses. They want to take over everything. Does that sound like the devil? Uh -huh. Huh? The devil apparently at one point was... Lucifer, a, a being of light, and who knows what he had. It bound to be amazing, and for how long, but that wasn't enough. Wasn't enough. No, I will be like the Most High, he said. I will exalt my throne above the sides of the north. And, and, and he tried to use words of what he believed to overcome God. That's as dumb as it gets there, boy, because God spoke back, and he said, you'll be brought down to hell. And so that's all the future he has to look forward to. Said out loud, I despise, I despise rebellion, rebellion and defiance. And defiance. It's, devilish. it's devilish. And I refuse, I refuse to, be to be disrespectful to God, God his, word, his word, his spirit, his, spirit, his, people, his people, his church, his, church, his, leaders. his leaders. Lord, show me, Lord, show reveal to me. How to speak respectfully and honorably and thankfully concerning you and all your things. Hallelujah. And see, that is synonymous with faith. That's faith. And all this other is the unbelief. Well, our time's up again today. Come back tomorrow. We're just getting into this. We'll see you soon back here in Faith School. I've got the victory living inside. Thank you for joining us at Faith School. Class is dismissed for today, but you can watch this and other episodes of Faith School free of charge at faithschool.org. For more information, visit our website or call us at 941-702-7390.